Okay, is that better? No echo? Um, excellent. So I am going to get us started um, with the introduction uh, to the Jack Richard um, annual uh, lecture series in endocrinology. Um, Dr. Richard was unable to join us today, um, but we are recording this so that he can hear it later. Sorry, I opened the wrong item here. Um, all right, so Dr. Richard is a Cornellian through and through, um, undergraduate at Cornell Medical School, internship, residency, and fellowship in endocrinology. Um, and as a faculty member in the Division of Endocrinology here at Cornell, he was devoted to his patients. He always made time for teaching and mentoring, um, a life-affirming role that he continued for almost 30 years. Dr. Richard has a particular interest in women's health and infertility. He has been an important mentor to Dr. Julianne Imperato McGinley, our former chief, who I see on the call today, um, and to many of our current faculty. He also showed valuable institutional initiative and leadership, serving as a member of the medical board of NYP, and later as a board of as a member of the board of fellows at the medical college. He closed his practice in 2013, but continued teaching medical ethics and also working part-time for the New York State Department of Health in the Office of Professional Medical Conduct. Dr. Richard's extensive philanthropy has been a living testament to his love and loyalty to Weill Cornell Medicine. In addition to his establishment of, a, of this fund for a visiting annual lecture in endocrinology, he also established a scholarship fund to help support medical students. Um, and his philanthropy also continues through a foundation that his parents created, the Henry and Ida Richard Foundation. To finish, in Dr. Jack Richard, we have a superb endocrinologist and teacher with outstanding service and scholarship to Cornell. Thank you, Dr. Richard, for all you've done for our patients, for the medical college, and for the Division of Endocrinology. And now I will turn the podium over to my colleague, Dr. Michelle Young, to introduce our renowned speaker, um, who I think is one of the most prominent experts in our world of endocrinology, Dr. Bill Young. Thank you so much, Dr. Alonzo. We are very happy to be back in person, or sort of back in person, to resume the Jack Richards Lecture Series. And today we have a very, very special guest speaker. Dr. William Young Jr. is the Tyson Family Endocrinology Clinical Professor and Professor of Medicine at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He there also served as the past chair of the Division of Endocrinology. He is the recipient of multiple ed ed education awards and is the past president of the Endocrine Society and is currently the editor-in-chief of JCUM case report. He has delivered more than 900 presentations at national and international meetings. He has been invited as a visiting professor for more than 150 medical institutions. Dr. Young's clinical and research focus is on adrenal and pituitary disorders. And he really truly is one of the experts that our endocrine community turns to for challenging pushing hyperaldosteronism and theochromocytoma cases. His career has also been much devoted to teaching and medical education. He has mentored countless trainees and published more than 300 scientific papers, including writing several Endocrine Society clinical practice guidelines. Dr. Young, on behalf of the Division of Endocrinology at Weill Cornell, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and Hospital for Special Surgery, we welcome you, and we truly are honored to have you join us this morning. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Young, for that <laughs> introduction. Um, and Laura, it's, it's a pleasure and honor to be here and to be the uh, 2022 Jack Richard Lecture. Um, named lectureships are, are really special. So I was asked to address Cushing syndrome this presentation. And just a few of the slides I'll be sharing with you are shown in this opening slide. Uh, with regard to this presentation, I have no relevant natural relationships to disclose, and I will not be discussing off-label drug usage. So some of you may know where Mayo Clinic's located. It's um, right in a small town, Rochester, Minnesota, which is southeastern uh, Minnesota. And we don't have any big 
body of water near us like you do. Um, and so this is actually the frigid part of the United States. Um, this is just a photograph looking out my office window uh, last winter when it was minus 31 <laughs> degrees out. And you, could, and you, you, know, you can't see it very well, but the temperatures that week were, were, were quite chilly. And I have a short video here. I don't think it's gonna work, but we'll try. So this is just me in my backyard. Um, and this day it was, I think, minus 21. And one of the things we do for fun is we put water in a cup and you throw it in the air when it's that cold. <laughs> it freezes and nothing hits the ground. Um, but let's see. Yeah, I don't think it's going to work, unfortunately. Oh. Anyway, you just take my word for it. You throw it up and it just all vaporizes. It just becomes uh, smoky. Um, Okay, now let's see if we can get past this. There we go. Okay, the outline for my presentation is shown here. We'll start with some key facts and messages, then a clinical overview of the phenotype of Cushing's, diagnosis, subtype diagnosis, when to get inferior petrosis sinus sampling. I'll review two typical cases and I'll conclude with some general guidelines. So, key facts and messages. Most patients we test for Cushing's will not have it. That's just a fact. Uh, and distinguishing between mild Cushing's and pseudo Cushing's, I think, is one of the toughest challenges for the clinical endocrinologist. And I don't think we should substitute a cutoff on an artificial test, for example, the DEX-CRH test, for common sense. So mild Cushing's versus pseudo Cushing's, take your time. There is no rush. All these patients are in a rush. We should not be in a rush. Uh, you have to be confident in your correct diagnosis before you send your patient off for operation. Whereas severe Cushing's is an endocrine emergency. There is no hormonal test that's superior to clinical judgment and always treat the patient and not the lab. And we have several examples of patients with very high 24 hour urine cortisols, but they don't have clinical Cushing's. An example of that is a patient with anorexia nervosa. It wasn't long ago, I had a patient referred for Cushing syndrome. I walk in the room, her BMI is 14, you know, her urine cortisol is high. Well, this is not Cushing syndrome. So this is the clinical phenotype. So the central obesity with thin extremities, I put in bold the findings that I find more specific for Cushing's. So when people gain weight, they typically gain weight everywhere, but they gain it centrally and the arms and legs actually get thinner. That's unique to Cushing's. Facial rounding is common. When people gain weight, their face gets rounder, just like everything else. But to have a facial plethora is fairly unique. Um, dorsal cervical fat pads, very common when people gain weight. But supraclavicular fat pads, this is a very unique steroid depot. Um, and I find that helpful. When you ask patients about easy bruising, almost everyone says yes, right? It's not helpful though. I don't even ask the question. Um, but Wide purple red stream, very helpful. Proximal muscle weakness, we just have the patients do a simple test where they're sitting in a chair like this, you have to put their arms out in front, just have them stand up. Now, if someone has Cushing's, it's very hard for them to do that without using their hands to get out of the chair. Tired eyes, uh, I'm gonna show you a couple examples of that, and nuance of curly hair. These are things that Patients don't read on the internet about Cushing syndrome, uh, and that can be helpful. And then there's a whole list of other signs and symptoms and disorders associated with Cushing's, but it's not specific for Cushing syndrome. So what I found is clinicians want to, you know, A, B, C, D, how do I do this? And um, like a cookbook recipe, and unfortunately, uh, every evaluation is individualized. The recipe is different for every patient. And this is hard. I need all the help I can get. There, one case detection test is not better than another. So typically I obtain all five case detection tests. I'll walk you through those in a minute. Um, now, when I'm talking about case detection testing, I'm talking about testing for clinical Cushing's, not subclinical Cushing's. Subclinical Cushing's is a totally different issue. The tests for clinical Cushing's are different than what we would use for subclinical Cushing's. Old photographs, I find very helpful. Um, so this woman looks like she could have 
Cushing syndrome. She has a fairly round uh, face. Uh, she, her face is plethoric. We can't see her clavicles. Um, but if you knew what she really is supposed to look like, it makes this diagnosis so easy. So when patients bring in old photographs, and we used to ask them to bring old photographs with them, but now everyone has mm -hmm. one of these, you know, mm -hmm. that they can pull out of their purse or pocket. Um, and that's very helpful. And sometimes it's the significant other that actually has the old photos. And this is a good example of the tired eyes of Cushing syndrome. Uh, and that's not something patients can make up. If you just look at them, and they have tired eyes. So serial photographs are important. Um, one of these individuals is going to develop Cushing's or the holiday photograph. I want you to pick which one you think is going to get Cushing syndrome, but you can't pick Santa. Um, <laughs> we could argue Santa already has that, right? <laughs> so that's the initial holiday photograph there. Here's one year later. Here's two years later. Now, one of these individuals right here, I, she kind of looks like she has Cushing's, but she looked like that at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, there hasn't been a real change for her. And three years later, everybody agree who's developed Cushing syndrome? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this woman in the white sweater on the most recent photograph slowly developed Cushing's and we can pick it up by looking at her photos over the years. Um, this is a woman who I saw about 10 years ago for Cushing syndrome. Um, and I, I communicated her recent, with her recently. We follow these patients for 10 years after surgery. The recurrence rate of pituitary Cushing's is 25%, which is terrible, it's dismal. Um, but that's the nature of pituitary dependent Cushing's. So that we need to do a 24 year for cortisol once a year for a decade. And her annual 24 year pre cortisols remained normal. Um, when I chatted with her, she specifically highlighted her observation that her curly hair resolved following surgery. And she said, My friend had a horse with Cushing's, and one of the main symptoms was curly hair. So, curly hair is another feature of cortisol excess. And that's why I listed it right there as in bold. So all photographs uh, can be very helpful in expensive screening tests. Uh, looking at diurnal variation in serum cortisol, 24-hour urine pre-cortisol, midnight salivary cortisols, and one milligram overnight tech suppression test. So those are our five case detection tests for Cushing syndrome. Um, so typically the afternoon cortisol, when I say afternoon, I mean 4 p.m., is about half of the morning cortisol. That would be normal diurnal variation. So we should suspect Cushing's if they lack diurnal variation. And neither number has to be abnormal. It could be 18 and 18. Uh, and those both are technically normal uh, cortisol values. 24 urine cortisol, if it's more than fourfold elevated, that must be Cushing's syndrome um, in the outpatient setting. And whereas if it's normal, it's unlikely, but the patient still could have Cushing's. Midnight salivary cortisol and our assay of the upper limit of normal, 100 is sufficient, and more than 200 is very likely that patient is Cushing. One milligram overnight tech suppression, less than 1.8 for the cortisol the next morning is usually normal, not always, and above 1.8 might be abnormal. So as we think about these five case detection tests, old photographs, um, you have to count for aging and usual weight gain people can have over time. Uh, with regard to AMP and certain cortisols, in terms of the absolute levels, oral estrogen is the most common cause of elevated cortisol in women. Uh, in terms of diurnal variation, uh, need to consider night shift, jet lag, and depression. In terms of 24-year cortisol, higher in volume, more than four liters, increases the clearance of cortisol. So cortisol levels in that 24 hour can be very high in a patient without Cushing's just simply because they're a water drinker. So we always have to look at the volume on the 24 hour urine. 
Then that salivary cortisol, when it's markedly elevated, like greater than 2000, that's usually contamination. And you could say contamination from what? Well, just to make our life easier, um, <laughs> there are forms of lip balms that contain uh, hydrocortisone. And finally, pituitary cushings. I have a whole cadre of patients with pituitary cushings that suppress more than 1.8 on the next day cortisol. And I have even more patients with false positives that are above 1.8. So what I'm trying to say is none of these case detection tests are diagnostic by themselves. And if you have a suspicion of Cushing's, I think you need to do all five case detection tests. With regard to the one milligram overnight tech suppression, I mentioned normal next day cortisol would be less than 1.8, abnormal above 1.8. We can get false positive testing with drugs that accelerate tax metabolism like anticonvulsants or phantom. You get false negative tests with drugs that decrease tax <coughs> metabolism, like intraconazole, ritonavir, fluoxetine, bupivin, semetivir. And false positive testing with drugs that increase CBG like oral estrogen. So those are our five case detection tests. Depending on your degree of clinical suspicion, you use one or all five. If a patient has obvious and severe Cushing's, I don't think we should be wasting time with measuring cortisol and saliva or doing a one milligram overnight tax suppression. We just need to prove it's endogenous Cushing's by measuring cortisol in the blood and in a 24-hour urine and move right on to subtype testing with an ACTH level. So if our 24 year cortisol is greater than 1,000 micrograms, our blood normal being 45, we need to pursue subtype testing as soon as possible. And these patients die from their Cushing syndrome. So I have a, a guidance for our endocrine fellows. They have seven days to figure out why a patient has Cushing syndrome, ACTH and Cushing's. If the cortisol, urine cortisol is over 1,000 and they can't find the cause of Cushing's in a week, we need to take out the adrenals and save the patient's life. Um, these patients, they can look well and healthy, but they are incredibly fragile. If the urine cortisol is diagnostic, in other words, above 200, but not markedly elevated, uh, we should pursue subtype testing promptly. Whereas if the labs are borderline or normal and makes pushing sound likely, we reevaluate if we have strong clinical suspicion and we consider monthly 24 year cortisol for most patients. And again, these are the patients that tend to push us the most for a diagnosis and treatment. Uh, but the point here is these patients don't die from Cushing's uh, and you have to have the correct diagnosis before pursuing an operation. So the biochemical phenotype, which I've outlined here, guides the urgency to resolve the diagnosis and treat the patient for cure. So all the causes of Cushing syndrome are shown on this slide. 85% um, are ACTH dependent. So most common being a pituitary microadenoma and be a pituitary macroadenoma, or it can be a ectopic tumor making ACTH, pulmonary carcinoid, GI carcinoid, pancreatic, or endocrine tumor. Well, 15% are ACTH independent. So the most common being a cortisol secreting adrenal adenoma, um, cortisol secreting adrenal cortical carcinoma, ACTH independent massive adrenal hyperplasia, or um, primary pigment or natural adrenal cortical disease. We'll go through some examples of these. So subtype evaluation starts by measuring serum ACTH. And if ACTH is undetectable, and that happens in 15% of our patients with Cushing's. Uh, the evaluation is fairly straightforward, it's adrenal CT. We find a unilateral adenoma or carcinoma, um, and that distinction is pretty easy to make on CT scan based on imaging phenotype. Whereas if we have bilateral masses, it might be primary bilateral macronology adrenal hyperplasia, might be this primary pigment and natural adrenal disease where the CT is usually normal, or bilateral cortisol screening adenomas. So I'll just go through some examples of these. So this is a, a young woman whose presentation was primarily proximal muscle weakness and scalp hair loss. 
and her, we documented Cushing's, her ACTH was low, CT abdomen, she has a two and a half centimeter lipid four at the moment. Cortisol secreting tumors are typically a lipid four, it's not very vascular as you can see. Another example of a cortisol secreting adenoma. Uh, when you take these out, there's associated uh, adrenal cortical atrophy caused by chronic suppression of ACTH. When it's a pure cortisol secreting adenoma, it suppresses ACTH. So the adrenals don't make DHEA. The DHEA sulfate will be low in a patient with a benign adrenal adenoma making cortisol. And this is the only, I put it in quotes because there are no onlys in medicine, but this is the only form of Cushing's that presents during pregnancy. It's a young woman that I saw actually postpartum. This is a postpartum photograph. And some of the worst abdominal stria you'll ever see are from women who develop Cushing's during pregnancy. Um, the reason that th this is the most common cause of Cushing's in pregnancy is these patients typically have an adrenal adenoma, but it's triggered by high levels of HCG to make more cortisol during pregnancy. So the signs and symptoms of Cushing's get worse during pregnancy. And it, these patients are unique in that it may take about two years or so for the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis to recover after surgery. Adrenal cortical carcinoma, um, uniformly, these are large and homogeneous lesions. And it, rarely do they make cortisol, just purely cortisol, like an adrenal adenoma. Uh, typically, the Cushing's is rapid at onset and severe. Um, cortisol, androgens, mineralocorticoids. Many, many make all three categories of steroids. Unfortunately, 60% of patients at the time of diagnosis have stage three disease, which is local extension and the median survival is four years. They have stage four disease, which is metastatic disease. The median survival is one year. Complete surgical resection is the only chance these patients have of a cure. So patients with primary bilateral macronodular adrenal hyperplasia have a CT scan signature. And you can see there's just massive nodularity of both adrenals on this axial coronal images. It's a different patient. They almost all look the same. When you take these out, it's just big nodule next to big nodule next to big nodule. So this is the adrenal equivalent of the toxic multinodular goiter and really is a CT diagnosis. This can be nothing else except macronodular adrenal hyperplasia. In terms of the signs and symptoms of cortisol excess, it's slow in onset, mild, or it can even be subclinical Cushing's. Uh, these patients, because it's been brewing for many years, to some more than two decades, will have severe osteoporosis. Parolazole production is always bilateral. Um, there's never a reason to do adrenal vein sampling in these patients. Testing for ectopic receptors, which many of these adrenal glands will have, is called research and not clinical care. It doesn't change what the clinician does. About 50% of these patients actually have a germline pathogenic variant in the Aradillo repeat containing 5 gene. And if it's not clinical Cushing's that it's determined merits treatment, we typically debulk those patients by resecting the larger adrenal gland. Whereas if it's clinical Cushing's, the treatment of choice is bilateral adrenal activity. Taking out one adrenal is not going to cure the Cushing syndrome. So primary pigment or nodular adrenal disease, this is a disorder that was actually described at originally at Mayo Clinic. Sometimes the CT looks like this, where the adrenal glands look actually fairly normal. Sometimes you'll see in intervening areas of atrophy as we see right there, and that's between the pigment or nodules. Since so patients have bilateral adrenalectomy, and um, it's just the exterior surface of the adrenals 
You can see all these pigmented nodules studying the adrenal glands. And here's a cut section of those adrenal glands. And typically, you, an adrenal, you would basically see yellowish brown um, thin layers of adrenal, not these black and brown nodules. So what Aidan Carney described was um, he, he was the first to recognize these adrenal glands as something unique and abnormal. And he correlated with other physical findings uh, shown in this graphic. So they, these patients with Carney complex have spotty facial pigmentation, especially on the eyelids, earlobes, and lips. It's a very unique appearance. Um, the biggest risk they have are the myxomas when they occur in the heart. Sometimes the presentation is actually stroke uh, for these patients. Um, myxomas can occur elsewhere. The men with carny complex get large cell calcifying citrulli cell tumors in the testicle. Uh, these patients are at risk for growth hormone excess, and they also can get you know, a unique form of a schwannoma. It's due to a mutation in the gene that encodes um, cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase A, regular group subunit 1 alpha. And I'm just going to share some photos of patients with carny complex. And you can see a recurring theme with pigmented lentigines over the eyelids, lips, ears, pigmentation of uh, the inner canthus of the eye. In this case, there's a myxoma on the upper eyelid. You can see that pigmentation in the inner canthus and the lentigines over the lip. So a typical presentation of Cushing's um, it has normal period adrenals. I'm showing you this CT um, because we actually, this patient actually had a fairly large nodule. That's a huge nodule for a patient with carny complex. And there's thickening in the left adrenal too. And that's that's atypical, not, not usual. The clue in, during the diagnostic workup is not only ACTH independent Cushing's and normal period adrenals on CT, but also when you give dexamethasone, cortisol levels rise. So it's a paradoxic response to dexamethasone administration. About half of the patients with PPNID have carny complex, the other half do not. So echocardiogram is always indicated because this is their highest risk throughout the one. So Cushing's is present, the treatment of choice is bilateral adrenalectomy. Bilateral cortisol secreting adenomas is actually a fairly common adrenal dependent form of Cushing syndrome. Um, and what we found is the less dominant adrenal always is making some cortisol. It's never totally silent on adrenal vein sample. Um, and in this case, the source of cortisol excess can be primarily the smaller adrenal gland. So taking out the larger adrenal is never the correct thing to do in a patient with bilateral cortisol secreted adenomas. And that's why to sort this out, these patients should have adrenal length sampling. And we've developed a dexamethasone uh, suppression protocol to do this. We published it in 2008, and we just updated our series. This is now it's um, accepted in EPUB format. It'll be published next year. Um, and so we've developed criteria to distinguish unilateral from bilateral autonomous cortisol secretion. So adrenal dependent Cushing's is easy compared to ACTH dependent Cushing's. When I see a patient with adrenal dependent Cushing, it makes my day. When I see a patient with ACTH dependent Cushing's, I know I'm in for a, a long haul in many respects. So unfortunately only 15% of our patients will have um, adrenal dependent Cushing's and 85% have ACTH dependent Cushing's. So ACTH typically mid-normal to increased. Next test should be a pituitary MRI. If you see a definite pituitary tumor, 
And if the clinical picture fits with pituitary repentant Cushing's, what do I mean by that? A woman, slow onset, mild to moderate Cushing's, urine cortisol is typically less than 600, usually it's around 200 micrograms. Usually you don't need inferior pertussis to sign a sampling in these patients. Whereas if the MRI is normal or equivocal, or if you see a pituitary tumor, but the clinical picture does not fit pituitary Cushing's, that's when you need to do inferior pertussis to sign a sampling. So what do I mean the clinical picture doesn't fit pituitary Cushing's, it's more consistent with that topic. Well, that topic is rapid onset, severe signs and symptoms, spontaneous hypokalemia, 24-hour urine cortisol greater than 1,000 micrograms, and male fat. Men with ACTH dependent Cushing's should be worried about ectopic from day one. So for these patients, I don't care what the pituitary MRI shows, unless it's a macroanonoma. The only time you can get a 24-hour urine cortisol over 1,000 micrograms in a patient with pituitary dependent disease is as if they have a big tumor, a big factor in making ACTH. So this is a patient, just as an example, what I mean by a definite pituitary microadenoma uh, in a woman with slow onset and mild ACTH and pushing, this MRI confirms pituitary tumors cause, and I would not do IPSS. However, if this patient presented with typical ectopic ACTH syndrome, hypokalemia, UFC very high, I ignore an apparent microadenoma on MRI. As you all know, about 10% of us will have a microadenoma on our MRI. And that, we run into that all the time when we're trying to sort out what's causing Cushing's syndrome. Now, this patient was referred for pituitary pain Cushing's. Kind of hard to see with the light here, but um, <clears throat> there was something very indistinct on the left side of the cella. And that's not what I would call a definite pituitary tumor. There is a correlation, as I inferred, between the size of the corticotrope patinoma and the 24 year in cortisol. 50% of our cases, the MRI looks normal. And typically, those patients have mild to moderate Cushing syndrome. And about 40% of our cases, you can actually see a microadenoma. 8%, it's a fairly large microadenoma, eight, nine millimeters. It's not a macroadenoma until it's greater than. 10 millimeters, and that's only about 2% of the patients. And that's the subset that can have severe Cushing's. Now, there are <clears throat> exceptions to every rule. This is a MRI from a 22-year-old woman I saw with Cushing's. Her AMP and cortisols, lack of general variation, but not markedly high. 24-year cortisol is only 74 micrograms, ACTH 79. She had a, almost a two centimeter cellar mass. What was unique about that mass is it's, it's hemorrhagic. So most of her tumor is actually infarcted in this case. So IPSS, I think, is the most important advance in the last three decades in the subtype evaluation of Cushing syndrome. <clears throat> a couple of rules. They have to have Cushing's on the day of IPSS. They, if they don't have active Cushing's on the day of IPSS, your data are worthless. IPSS does not diagnose Cushing's. I've seen clinicians refer patients for IPSS to try to diagnose Cushing's. It doesn't. It just tells you where ACTH is coming from. All of us in this room, ACTH is coming out of our head, just like a patient with pituitary dependent Cushing's. So this is just a typical radiograph during IPSS. So the, the cutoffs to distinguish between pituitary dependent and ectopic uh, at baseline before giving CRH or DVABP the central to peripheral ACTH gradient greater than two to one. After giving CRH or DVABP central peripheral ACTH gradient more than three to one. We also take advantage of looking at the uh, stimulation of ACTH with cortisol in the peripheral vein uh, pituitary dependent Cushing. Typically, ACTH rises more than 50% from baseline. Cortisol rises more than 20% from baseline. Whereas with most ectopics, that does not occur. That's just a typical 
data set. I'm concerned about the adequacy of IPSS. We uh, check prolactin levels, although we, we do not routinely run them. We save blood if we want to run them. Um, first thing I look at, does the patient have active Cushing's on the day of IPSS? So over on the left, this is just minus one and minus five minutes before either CRH or DDABP. And these are the time points after giving CRH or DDABP. So yes, the patient had active Cushing's on this day. Next, I look at what's the gradient between central and peripheral. We look at the maximum IPS, in this case, along 1,000 compared to 119. And to say it's the two that are dependent, you want to see that more in two to one. And rarely it's, it's close to two to one. Usually it's quite high, not necessarily 97 to one, but, but quite high. And then we look at the gradient after uh, giving CRH or DDADP, and that needs to be more than three to one, to be honest, much greater than three to one. Um, and the purple vein, uh, ACTH rose more than 50%. It rose actually 356%. We averaged the, the two baseline values and we averaged the two peak values uh, to make that determination. And in this case, peripheral cortisol levels also rose more than 20% um, with, within the peripheral sample of peak values being at 45 minutes and, and 60 minutes. So I want to go over two typical cases, and then I'll conclude with some general guidelines. <clears throat> this is a 26-year-old woman who was referred for a second opinion on whether she might have Cushing's. She developed subtle signs and symptoms of glucocorticoid excess over two and a half years. With plans for fertility, she stopped her oral contraceptive pill three years ago, and she hasn't had a menstrual period. So she saw a consultation with a reproductive endocrinologist. Serum prolactin was normal, but DHA sulfate was more than two-fold elevated. Her symptoms include insomnia. She wakes between 11.30 and 1.30 a.m. and feels wired. That wired feeling is a really common description for patients who have hypercortisolism. She had new onset acne, mild hirsutism, not a lot of weight gain, only four kilos. So she had some of it to positive above her cap, uh, clavicles, some on the face and abdomen. New onset hypertension. She's working hard to prevent weight gain. She has a high intensity exercise program, five days a week, 45 minutes. And she's on alpha methyl dopa for her antihypertensive. So DHA sulfate's high. She has this unique form of insomnia, mild weight gain, new onset hypertension. Her BMI is only 21.8. Her blood pressure is not well controlled. She did not appear overtly cushionoid to me. Her skin was normal. She had no purple red stria. She had a flat abdomen. Compared to old photograph, she had developed supracavicular bulbs. She had good muscle tone and no proximal muscle weakness. So this is her physical appearance when I see her. I mentioned the flat abdomen, no stria. That's her wedding photograph. You can see her clavicles very easily. And if we compare it to the photographs we took, you don't see her clavicles very easily. So you can see she has deposited some fat in this cortisol sensitive fat depot compared to her wedding photograph. And remember, her goal is, is pregnancy. That's why she stopped oral contraceptive pill and she has secondary amenorrhea. Her <clears throat> potassium is normal, glucosal hemoglobin is normal. Her ADM cortisol is 23. It's also been 15 and 22.9. He does have some diurnal variation. Her afternoon cortisol is 14. However, 24 hour urine cortisol excretion has been elevated every time it's been measured. Upper normal is 45, 111, 
296, 103. It's, she, she's not a water drinker, so she does not have excessive urine volume. <clears throat> Her late night salivary cortisols are about twofold elevated. ACTH 80, 50, 88, and DHA sulfate is elevated. Sometimes <clears throat> I still do a high dose overnight dexamethasone suppression test. When you see patients suppress more than 90% with high dose dex, it confirms that they have pituitary dependent disease. High dose dex is not a very good way to distinguish between ectopic and pituitary dependent Cushing's unless they suppress more than 90%. Ectopic never suppresses more than 90%. Here's her pituitary MRI. She has this little two millimeter hypodent area on the left side of the cell. Now, this is smaller than the Endocrine Society guidelines would suggest um, where we could skip IPSS. I advise her that with her symptoms, supraclavicular fat pads, elevated urine cortisol on three occasions, increased salivary cortisol, that I was comfortable with the diagnosis of Cushing syndrome. I said she's had a slow clinical course, mild degree of Cushing's, more than 90% dex suppressibility, plus we can see a microadenoma. I told her that's diagnostic of pituitary dependent Cushing's. And that IPSS does carry some risk, and I, we did not need it. In terms of risk, uh, <clears throat> in the NIH experience, uh, one out of 508 patients experienced brainstem injury. In our early series, we had two patients who had serious complications. Uh, series out of France, they had two patients that had serious complications. So IPSS is not an innocent uh, procedure to do. So I, I personally always want to be sure I actually need it. And I don't need it, this person, despite the endocrine side guidance. So on transferal surgery, there was a small tumor on the left side of the cella. However, um, what was given to pathology did not show an adenoma. Cortisol the day after surgery was lower, but not as low as we'd like to see. However, she was symptomatic with diffuse myalgias. Since her cortisol was not lower than two micrograms the day after surgery, we're concerned she might develop recurrent pushings over time. We dismissed her on prednisone, 10 in the morning, 5 in the afternoon. We tapered it to an milligram every week, but we got down to 5 milligrams every morning. Her two-week post-op morning cortisol was better. It was 2.6. Once her prednisone got to 5 every morning, we switched her to hydrocortisone 20 every morning for two weeks, and then we kept her at 15 milligrams every morning thereafter. We don't taper hydrocortisone once we get to 15. We keep them there. At her four-month four post-op visit, cortisol is 2.9. She'd lost down four kilos without even trying. The face was thinner. Superclavicular fat pads resolved. Blood pressure normalized. And her menstrual cycles restarted. Six months uh, post-op, cortisol is 9.3. Nine months, cortisol is above 10. And at that point, we stopped her hydrocortisol. One year post-op, 24 year cortisol was normal. 18 months post-op, they delivered a healthy baby boy, which was her original goal. Four years post-op, she remains well, and she recently delivered her second child. And she'll get that annual 24 year cortisol for 10 years. So key points from this case, distinguishing between mild cushions and pseudo cushions, I think is one of the most difficult things we do. We should never be in a rush. We need to build a wall of evidence, either support or refute the diagnosis. Not all patients with symptomatic Cushing's have the classic physical exam photos and signs. Physical exam signs. Photos can be very helpful. And seeing her develop that superclavicular fullness really helped me, convince me she actually had Cushing's syndrome. Dorsal cervical fat pads uh, can develop in anyone's gains weight, but supraclavicular fat pad was very specific. 
And as I showed in this case, we don't do cosyntropin stem tests after curing a patient with Christian syndrome. Um, we simply check a morning cortisol before they take their morning dose of hydrocortisol. We do that every six weeks. And that assesses where the, the hypothalamus is making CRH, where the pituitary is making ACTH, and where the adrenals are making adequate cortisol. Doing a cosyntropin stem test just tells you what the adrenal glands are doing. And that's not what we're waiting for to wake up. We're waiting for the hypothalamus and pituitary. So we actually published the article on this couple of years. Um, in some patients with cured pituitary panic questions, like this patient, you don't see a tumor. And the group at University of Virginia looked at this a few years back. They had 29 patients with pituitary dependent Cushing's where there was no confirmation on pathology and 66% had a long-term cure. So they came up with some ideas of what the cause may be. Uh, the tumors were removed but not provided for the pathologist to look at. Um, the tumor was not sampled in the specimen provided to the pathologist. Adenoma lost in the suction apparatus. That's what we usually say. Um, or the adenoma was too small to be detected in routine histology. But there are many patients like this where you know, the path report is not informative at all, but the patient has a long-term care. The second case is a 16-year-old young man, six-month history of facial rounding. After returning from winter school break, his classmates didn't recognize him. He had acne over his face, chest, and back, a muscle weakness. He can't lift weights like he had done during football season. He had new stretch marks. His BMI is 26.6, and he had developed hypertension. And that's his current facial appearance. And you can see his history. He was hypokalemic. His blood cortisols were markedly elevated. He lacked iron variation. ACTH was elevated. 24 year cortisol was almost 3,000 micrograms. Here's his pituitary MRI scan. It was read as left sided pituitary adenoma. Based on that MRI scan, he went to transplant surgery. So, a mark Crook's Highland chain. Crook's Highland chain just tells you your patient has Cushing syndrome. Doesn't tell you why. Post op cortisol was high. So, this is my algorithm for persistent or recurrent Cushing's. The question was Cushing's cured for a period of time. If it was, and if immunohistochemistry chemistry was positive, patients can only have one cause of Cushing's. And so, that patient has recurrent pituitary Cushing's. So, you need to do an MRI. You see the tumor. Your options are second transplant surgery, gamma knife, or bilateral adrenalectomy. Whereas if you don't see the tumor, um, bilateral adrenalectomy or medical management. This patient I'm presenting falls into the right side of this algorithm. Cushing's was not cured, and immunohistochemistry chemistry of the pituitary was negative. So what's the clinical phenotype? Is it ectopic? If it's ectopic, we should do CT chest abnormalities and consider a dotatate scan. These patients need an urgent cure. Whereas if the clinical phenotype was pituitary, then a repeat pituitary MRI, IPSS, if it wasn't done the first time around, transplant surgery number one, gamma knife if you have a target, bilateral adrenalectomy or medical management. This patient is screaming at COVID, right? So I'll, the first day I saw him, um, I started him on potassium supplementation, spironolactone, ketoconazole, and Bactrim. Most of these patients with severe Christians will have uh, underlying pneumocystis. It's important to treat them with Bactrim prior to the operation. On day two, I got his uh, CT of chest, abdomen, and pelvis. CT of chest was normal. CT abdomen is shown here. He had these unusual cystic lesions in the liver some of which had a um, vascular rim by them. And he had this lesion in the small bowel. This was before we had uh, the gallium 68 dotatate PET CT. So this is an octreotide scan. And you can see the spleen, the left kidney, the right kidney, 
and there's uptake in that lesion I showed you on CT. It's hard to see, but there's patchy uptake throughout the liver uh, in those lesions. 24 year and 5 HA was elevated. So on the fifth day of seeing him, and again, these patients need an urgent cure. These patients die from Cushing's. <clears throat> Planos resect is primary GI carcinoid. Resect liver mets if feasible. All tumor could not be resected. Proceed with bioletal trinolectomy during the same operation. So here's the operative report um, from the pathologist. Uh, well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor, 2.8 cm in the ileum. Um, what we saw in the CT was actually th this mesenteric node measured 3.1 cm. The rest of the lymph nodes were negative. A couple of wedge resections of the liver were positive for metastatic carcinoid. And it was clear that these could, all, could not all be resected. So the patient went on to a bilateral adrenal ectomy. Post-op, he had glucocorticoid taper, all signs and symptoms of Cushing's resolved. Went on octreotide long acting release. He had some shrinkage in his hepatic mats with that. He had restaging, no extra hepatic disease was evident. Uh, so he underwent a liver transplant 18 months post op. 24 years old, no evidence of recurrent disease. So let me conclude with some general guidelines in terms of the pace of the evaluation. If symptoms are mild, biochemical test borderline, take your time. The goal is to not correct lab values, but rather to treat signs and symptoms of Cushing's. If you're having trouble confirming Cushing's, there is no rush. If the patient has severe ACTH-dependent Cushing's and the source of ACTH is not evident, I don't think we should waste any time. These patients need to see an expert laparoscopic adrenal surgeon it's a very safe operation, and we need to save that patient's life. There is no one algorithm or recipe for the diagnosis or the subtype evaluation. Clinical features dictate the test for confirmatory and subtype testing. No biochemical test should overrule clinical intuition. A man with ACTH dependent Cushing's, think at top of everything. A woman with slowly developing mild, moderate ACTH dependent cushions almost certainly is going to be a pituitary tumor. And I think IPSS is only needed in a minority of patients with pituitary dependent disease. Never lose sight of the goal. It's to diagnose symptomatic patients with cushions and provide them with an effective long term care. Couple of references, clinical experience, common sense, those are important. Um, endocrine society guidelines on Cushing's. Uh, this is that paper I mentioned where we showed you don't need to do post entropic stem tests post op. Uh, it's a book that Irina Bankos and I published uh, earlier this year 100 cases from the adrenal clinic. And the first patient I presented is actually case number uh, 56 in that book. And with that, I'd be pleased to address any comments or questions you may have. I have a question about the first case you presented. Yeah. Was so well, thank you. That was excellent. Do you always send patients home after pituitary surgery on cortisol replacement, regardless of the post op cortisol? Yeah. Or like, do you have a cutoff and ever send patients not on So the, the question is, do we always send patients home um, on glucocorticoid replacement following a pituitary operation or pituitary cushions? And the answer is no. Uh, if the cortisol the morning after surgery is the same as it was before surgery, uh, we say, and if the patient feels well, unfortunately. Um, we say, well, it looks like we didn't cure you. We're going to keep you in town. So we dismiss all these patients the day after surgery. We keep them in town. We measure cortisol every morning for about a week. We've had patients that 
you know, they're 23, 23, and bam, they're two. Three days, four days. I have, I don't understand it. It's, it's like the adrenals are on autopilot. And it's all of a sudden they realize, oh, we're not seeing AC patients anymore. I, I honestly don't know what the what the pathophysiology is of that, but it happens. So we look for that. Um, there are these borderline cases. This case that I presented was not that borderline. I think she was seven, and I'd always and she was symptomatic. I'd always give them glucocorticoid, but again, as I mentioned, I'm I was concerned. I'm still concerned. She might have recurrent pushings over time. Um, I think if it's above 10 and the patient's asymptomatic, usually we don't replace them. If it's below 10, and especially if they're symptomatic, we give them glucocorticoid to go home. We usually use prednisone at that point because it's a longer acting glucocorticoid. There's plenty of time for them to go through withdrawal. We, we want them to recover from their operation. So typically they're on prednisone for about six weeks post-op. Once we have them down to either five and two and a half or five in the morning, and then we switch them to a equivalent dose of hydrocortisone. And that's when they really start going through withdrawal. And do you tell those patients that they're most likely going to occur, those who, let's say, their post op cortisol is 12? What do you, how do you counsel them? Yeah, so post op cortisol is 12. I, I tell them, I tell them you know, it looks like we, may have removed part of your tumor, but we may not have removed it all. And we need to follow you closely. Um, and uh, if we document we haven't cured them and we're more than a month out, we have, we have to decide what we're going to do. So there's second transvaloidal, which at our institution is not very successful. I mean, the most common reason for these patients to go down to 12 but not lower is because part of the tumor's in the cavernous sinus and the surgeon couldn't get it. So those patients, we have to decide, you know, what, what are we gonna offer them for a permanent cure? Um, Yeah, so, so the comment is uh, at the NIH, the protocol is to have an indole and cannula, draw morning cortisol, and then is it late afternoon or is it midnight? It was actually better, like 11 p.m. 11. Actually, there was bleeding, so the yeah. line was there, and I could go to yeah. the airport. Of course, you can do that there because people get admitted. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And clearly, that would be the optimal way with uh, comments that drawing in at 11 p.m. cortisol with the patient sleeping. That's that would be fantastic if I could do that, but no, we we can't. Amazingly accurate, and so, so but but the 4 p.m. I I kind of get a lot of I'm mainly focused on fibrosis, so I do a lot of initial screening for questions. I think it's suggested. I don't need to do much with the medicine. So I do get a lot of patients that bring outside results of like the post diagonal cortis is measured at different times of the day. I tend to ignore them. But I noticed that you do check when you need to see them. That's why. We do check it. And actually, we, we find it helpful. I mean, again, it's just one piece of the puzzle, right? Um, Whereas if I had access to a midnight blood cortisol, mm -hmm. I think that would be a more powerful piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. So you do recommend at least two times? Yeah, yeah, that, it, it helps. Yeah. I'm gonna try to squeeze in a brief second lecture. But, uh, <laughs> one of my biggest challenges in this area is patients who have a pituitary or renal scapuloma and in doing our due diligence to get yeah. out screening for, for Cushing's, we get sort of mildly positive uh, screening tests. And like in my heart of hearts, I know they don't have Cushing's, but it's just something is going on by the 
big guy cortisol all those levels and you're gonna salivary cortisol or something like that. What would be your like best clinical tools to sort of not be chasing down rabbit hole or like test that response to basically prove that the person doesn't have nutrition and you know they don't, but they have this level. So Brian's asking, what what's the best test to exclude Cushing's in a patient with an incidental loma? It's a patient where your clinical suspicion is zero, <laughs> right? Zero. Uh, I think a 24-hour urine-free cortisol has the lowest false positive rates of all the tests I mentioned. The one caveat is, and what we're learning is Many patients with an adrenal incidentaloma can have this subclinical glucocorticoid secretory autonomy, which can contribute to hypertension, mm -hmm. hyperglycemia, osteoporosis, um, weight gain, hyperlipidemia. So, so although 24 hour cortisol is a good test to exclude clinical Cushing's, if you're looking for subclinical Cushing's, the 24-hour urine cortisol is not a good test. And for those patients, you need a measure of autonomy. And for that is where the dexamethasone suppression test comes in. Because a patient with true subclinical Cushing's looks like everyone in this room. I mean, they, they don't look like they have Cushing's. But that might be the cause of their hypertension, for example, or their hypoglycemia. So in the setting of adrenal incidentaloma, I think we should screen them for subclinical glucocorticoid secretory autonomy. And the best single test is overnight dex suppression. Use the same dose for the dex. The amount of each normal pressure would give different doses depending on the Yeah. So the question is, do, do you, I give them all the same dose of dex? So I, I think a reasonable Screening test is either a one or two milligram overnight tax. I use two milligrams of BMIs over 30. Um, but I would never send a patient to surgery for an adrenal incidentaloma because of glucocorticoid secretory autonomy unless I have absolutely confirmed it with an eight milligram overnight tax. So I've, I've mentioned now there's two roles for eight milligrams. One is to absolutely confirm a patient with pituitary dependent Cushing's. The other is in a patient with what you think is subclinical Cushing's to prove it. Because if you give eight milligrams of dex, right? That's 16 times more glucocorticoid than a human makes in a day. Everyone should have zero cortisol in their blood the next morning. But if this patient has a cortisol the next morning at 3.2, that tells you that adrenal is dosing your patient mm -hmm. with cortisol every day, leaking out of this nodule every minute, every hour, 24 hours a day. And that does predispose to osteoporosis and hypertension and weight gain and hyperlipidemia. Um, I personally don't have a cutoff. I mean, where we're all in a quandary is, when do we send that patient to surgery? The younger the patient, the more aggressive I am. I mean, it's as if that patient's taking three milligrams of prednisone every day. None of us would, for no good reason, give a patient three milligrams of prednisone. Um, but that adrenal nodule is doing that. And your patient's 28 years old. It's, good. it's not going to go away. It, it's going to be there the rest of her life. So the younger the patient, the more aggressive we are in that center. Yeah. What's new about the molecular causes of pituitary patients? And are they they're monoclonal? Yeah, they are monoclonal. Um, I'm going to refer you to a. <laughs> Very good article by uh, Shlomo Melmet in uh, Endocrine Reviews it was just recently, where he really walks through everything that's known about the molecular uh, pathogenesis of horicotropa adenomas. But yeah, the short answer they are monoclonal. Right. Okay. Looks like we're starting to lose people. Um, okay. Yeah, that was an absolutely, absolutely terrific lecture. Um, the comments are reflecting that as well. So thank you very much again. And I um, hope you have a great trip here and safe trip home. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.